Okay, so today we're gonna we're gonna talk about two more methods of numerical solution of partial differential equations. All right, and the first one that we're gonna discuss is finite elements. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna say about finite elements is that this is a massive area of engineering um, and um, engineering analysis. And you can go get a PhD and have a long career in finite elements. All right, so I am gonna brush over it in about 20 minutes. <clears throat> um, and I'm gonna give you basically just a taste of what the basics of finite element analysis is and just enough so that you have some idea of what the heck's going on behind the scenes, but not such that you understand finite elements, all right? completely. Okay, so remember that for the first thing we did was develop in some analytical solutions to partial differential equations, all right? And, and these were solutions that solved our partial differential equation subject to the boundary conditions and initial conditions that we set forth, all right? So the one analytical solution that we've talked about was the analytical solution for a step change in head for a uh, one-dimensional infinite aquifer where on one side the head automatically changed um, at time zero, right? So then we talked about, so that was an analytical solution. We took the partial differential equation and we came up with a, a function, all right? So we remember that what, what, we, what we end up doing here is, uh-oh, oh, let's see what's wrong. Um, we're after, well, let, let's just, let me back up. Let me back up. We had been talking about, um, let's consider, one dimensional heterogeneous uh, steady state groundwater flow equation. All right, so our, our PDE for this case would look something like this. We'd have the partial derivative DDX. It's heterogeneous, so we would have K inside the spatial derivative DH DX. All right, and it's steady state, so it equals to zero. All right, so what we're after in the world, we want some solution. We seek some, some function that gives me the head as a function of distance, all right? I'd be able to map or calculate the head at any place x in my domain such that all right, so such that st, such that, we honor our boundary conditions. All right, so in general, when we're, when we're solving a PDE, that's what we're after. We're after some function of that allows us to calculate head at any place in space or time, all right, such that we honor any initial conditions and boundary conditions. Okay, 
So the first thing he did is derive an analytical solution to one of these kinds of equations. And that's where we, we came up with a, a functional form for h of x that fit this statement that the partial derivative with respect to x of k times the partial derivative of h with respect to x all right, was equal to the partial derivative with respect to time of head. All right, and subject to the boundary conditions and initial conditions. All right, that was our analytical solution. And then we said, you know, you can only find these analytical solutions in very rare cases. So we developed finite difference method. And that was where instead of these derivatives, we, we could approximate the derivative by a finite difference. The head between two locations separated by a a location delta x. All right, and we came up with this whole method of finite differences, and we talked about how you could solve the system of equations that arises from those finite differences numerically, and that that was a way to approximate a solution to our partial differential equation. And we did finite differences for our simple one-dimensional case, and then we talked about finite differences or three-dimensional case where we have heterogeneity and different grid spaces. So those are our basic numerical techniques we've talked about so far. All right, so today we're gonna talk about finite elements, all right? And a finite element, again, is, um, So the finite element method is another way to approximate a solution to our partial differential equations. All right, um, but it is fundamentally from the very beginning different than finite differences. Um, so it's, it really is, it's fundamentally different from the very equations that we're gonna consider. than finite differences. And it has, that comes with it, um, some advantages and some, ad, some disadvantages. But the primary advantage and the reason why finite element is probably one of the more robust areas of computational engineering that there is, is that allows, the fundamental thing it does is it allows estimation of head, all right, of H on complex three-dimensional geometries. All right, and this is the, this is the reason why, this, this reason alone is really why we do mostly is why we do finite elements. There are potentially some others, but that's more in the weeds. Okay, so what do I what do I mean by that? Well, recall that here's our finite difference grid. And recall that when, we, when we're when we doing finite differences, we're breaking the world up into this series of blocks, 
All right, and these are squares in two dimensions and they're line segments in one dimension and they are cubes in three dimensions. I'm just gonna do two dimensions because it's easier to draw. But we end up with this, we end up with a grid of blocks. All right, and these blocks can be, they can be different. We talked about this for mod flow. We might say, well, I want some skinny blocks over here. And then I want some fatter blocks. But they are in rows and columns. And so they are always rectangles. And if I have some skinny columns here, I'm going to have skinny columns all the way through my domain. All right. This is fine, but if we have, you know, think about geology. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw geology in a different color here. I'm gonna use red. And let's say I've got a, a sandstone layer and it's got some complex folding in it, right? And this is my aquifer. All right, so my finite difference grid is regular. All right, and my real world geometry is definitely irregular, right? It's, it's, it's got all kinds of different geometry to it. All right, and in a finite difference grid where, every, where my world is all these blocks, it's really hard for them to mesh up with curving boundaries. So what finite elements does So there's always this mismatch when we're modeling with a finite difference code there's this mismatch between squares and curves All right and it's really hard to cleanly do curve geometry with finite differences. So the fundamental difference with finite elements I'm going to now I'm going to draw my curving sandstone again to start off with. All right, so here, you know, this again is my real world. But in finite elements in two dimensions, our grid look like triangles. All right, and these triangles allow me to very well approximate real geometry. And my triangles, an important part of finite elements is from, they're very, these triangles can be variably shaped. So some of them might be big fatties, all right? So a finite element mesh has all these, we call these things nodes. So these are nodes. And a series of nodes defines an element. All right. And at, the, at its very heart, Essentially what we're doing is we are able to interpolate the value of the head anywhere on this element from the value of head that we estimate at any of the nodes. All right. The fundamental reason why we do finite elements is that we can do uh, complex geometry 
um, because our our elements are triangles, and so they're much. It's much easier to have it conform to these to these curves. All right. So this is the fundamental reason why we do finite elements. We can and we can make these as an example. Like if if we have really curvy things, the the lines that connect these two. Um, nodes they don't have to be a straight line they can be a curve there's all kinds of fancy stuff we can do with these finite elements um so but the bottom line is as groundwater hydrologists the really nice thing is for our really complicated subsurface geometry finite elements allow us to accurately sort of mesh that um okay so it 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 they are awesome and we use them a lot but it comes at some some cost all right and the primary cost for you right now is considerably more mathematical rigor and thinking about how we derive finite elements and i'm going to gloss this over heavily but i want i want to consider Again, our um, 1D heterogeneous um, groundwater flow equation. Uh, but I'm going to add something. I'm going to add with like recharge or with a source or sink. All right, so um, here's what our equation looks like. Here's what our PDE is. It says D DX of K DH DX. All right, one dimensional heterogeneous groundwater flow plus some source f of x all right and this source could be anything it could be recharge into our aquifer it could be a well all right we're free to define what the function f of x is so if it was recharge like constant recharge across the aquifer f of x would be a constant all right equal to some value all right and oh and we want this to be steady state so it's equal to zero let me put that steady state here. All right. So this is our partial differential equation. Now there's, um, and remember that what we're after here, we seek, I, I have no idea what just happened to my line. Why is it moving? Remember that we seek some solution H of X that conforms to our um our equation and given our boundary conditions all right i'm just restating what i stated already okay here is some finite element terminology one i'm gonna i'm gonna label this equation one all right one is consider is called the strong form of our partial differential equation. And there's some mathematical reason for why we call it the strong form. Uh, the basic reason is because we're, we're requiring that our solution be differentiable at each, that our equation includes these derivatives at each point, all right? And it, and it makes it the statement, um, and the solution very specific, All right? Um, and uh, so one point here is that finite differences, so finite differences, FD, are a discretization All right, of one. 
All right, so we've taken this PDE and finite differences and we figured out how we make a finite difference operator by um, essentially discretizing these, these derivatives. All right, that was finite difference. Okay, so for finite elements, we're going to do something. Uh, we're going to change this equation. And we're going to write what's called the weak form. Of one. All right. And the basic idea of this is that we want to find first of all, uh, actually, let me let me back up a little bit. I'm gonna I'm gonna just say that we could rewrite. one using Darcy's law d dx of q plus f of x is equal to zero Right, and all I did was take k dh dx and 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 say, hey, Darcy's tells me that's q. All right. Okay, so the weak form is we're going to we 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 want to find. H within a subspace S. All right, we can talk about. So this, we're we're going to do some because we're doing finite elements. We're going to do some some math. This like E looking symbol. This means within. All right, and S is a subspace. All right. So S is a subspace or a mathematical space. We're going to talk about that, what that means here in a second. But this is a, a mathematical space. Is it supposed to be a squiggly S or just a regular S? You can, you know, Claire, this is a cursive S, but you can, you can call it whatever the hell you want. But I'm going to use a cursive S, all right? The bottom line is it's it's some space that H falls within. All right. Some example of that could be that if if H let's say H is a line. All right. A, 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 a line of the class M X plus B. H falls in within a much bigger space of all polynomials of order N. Right? All a line is, is a polynomial of order one. Right? So H would fall within this mathematical space, which is all the polynomials we could ever imagine of infinite order. All right? H would fall within that. Okay, so we want to find H within S such that. All right? For all, so I'm going to introduce another notation. This is for all. For all W within V, all right? W are going to be another set of functions, and V is another space. The following holds. The integral from zero to L of 
dw dx q dx is equal to the integral from zero to L of W F dx. Okay. This is called the weak form. Number two is the weak form. There's two important things that we've done. It's now in, we've integrated over the entire length. That's why it's called the weak form. We've just said that the equations um, only need to be equal over the full integrated length, all right? Um, and we've multiplied by this function, this set of functions, uh, or this function w. So w we're gonna call some nomenclature, it's called a weighting function. Um, We'll just call it the weighting function. Okay, we're not gonna go into it, but let me just tell you that if we perform the integrals and, um, and apply boundary conditions and do some, um, uh, we integrate by parts and we apply boundary conditions, we can show that the weak form and the strong form of these two equations are definitely the same thing. All right, so this is, all we've really done is apply by the, apply this, multiply by this uh, weighting function W and then integrate, all right? And then we, we have to do some, some chain rule stuff, but bottom line is one and two are the, are the same, all right? Now, the important point here is that what finite elements do is we, in finite elements, we discretize two. And not one. All right, so in finite elements, we're working with this other flavor of our partial differential equation, all right? And that's the weak form. So when you, when you talk about, or when you read about finite elements, they'll probably talk about the weak formulation and then they'll rewrite the function and in the weak formulation. And essentially it's this, you multiply by some weighting function and then you integrate, all right? Um, okay, uh, so when we discretize, the common way we do that is called the Galerkin. Uh, approximation. Actually, before we get to Galerkin, approximation let's let's say something about s and v so s and v are what we call hilbert spaces and all that means um are They are infinitely, actually before I, or I call them Hilbert spaces, I'm gonna say they're infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces. And what do I mean when, when I say that? Uh, Hilbert space, sorry. Well, what that means is that a Hilbert space is bounded. 
It means that like this space has boundaries. What is happening? bounded and there's a concept where you can measure distance between entities all right that is basically the two rules to have a hilbert space there's more stuff and a mathematician probably beat me over the head for simplifying it like this but your space is boundaries and you can measure the distance within that space all right, so like a Euclidean space, you know, it has some, we can always measure the distance between two entities within a Euclidean space and we use, um, we use uh, the Pythagorean theorem to do that, all right? To measure the distance between two locations in X, Y, Z space, all right? So as an example, of a Hilbert space. Uh, one space could be the space, I'm going to call it P to the N. All right, this is the space bounded or the space of all polynomials. order n or order less than equal to n and n goes to infinity all right so this is like you could think about this as the range of values that all the polynomials that we could possibly come up with of order of infinite order could reach all right any number that we wanted to to create could be reached by this set of polynomials all right that's that's probably most numbers you could think of all right all right so here is the here's the fundamental thing of the galerkin method so the galerkin approximation is to say, okay, I know the weak form holds if I consider this like infinite dimensional space and every polynomial that exists, you know, and, and when I do that, I know that one and two are equal. But what I wanna say is that I can't consider all of those different functions. And so I'm gonna consider a subspace WH within S sub H. And S sub H is a subset of S. So an example might be instead of all infinite order polynomials, I might just do polynomials of order zero and one lines. All right. And those fall within this space of all polynomials that I could ever think of. So this is, this is the guts. This is the guts of the finite element discretization. We're just gonna consider, we're gonna say that I'm gonna approximate my solution of two by only considering polynomials, say, of a, of a smaller order. And I'm also going to consider then uh, Q sub H, all right, the subset of V sub H. All right. Q sub H is my sort of my solutions for the groundwater flux. And they are now in this subspace 
of V where my solution lives, all right? And it's a truncated subspace. So it's not, this, this, this approximation is important. It adds error. It says these WHs and Q sub Hs are not, two is not exactly equal to one anymore. Two is just approximately equal to one. The weak form is just approximately equal to the strong form. All right, so the finite dimensional form of the, of the, of the weak form, so the finite dimensional, is the integral from zero to L, my weighting functions now come from this smaller space, WH, so the WH dx, Q sub H. My groundwater fluxes come from this smaller subspace of groundwater fluxes, WH F of X dx. All right. WH gets called the weighting functions. And Q sub H, we call our trial solutions. All right, so we've gone to this smaller, the smaller subspace. And we're going to do one more. Um, both of these are finite dimensional. Functions and subspaces. All right. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to say that. Um, We're gonna break, let me, uh, let me label this three. So this is our finite dimensional form of the weak form, all right? And we could break three up into elements, all right? And, um, And we're gonna we're gonna write sum over all elements zero to L W E D X Q H E X. And I will, I'll try and give some intuition on this in just a sec. W E H of X DX. All right, what we're saying is it now that if we had some function we were trying to approximate, so Remember, we were like seeking, let's say, some function h of x. And it looks whatever, it looks something like this. We're going we're gonna to break x up into a bunch of nodes and elements. So these elements. call omega. So these are my nodes, these are my elements. 
All right, the element is the dis is the difference between these two nodes, and we're gonna we're we're basically looking to come up with this series of basis functions that give us the head at each one of these locations, and it's the interpolation by summing. these basis functions from node to node. Um, <clears throat> so, I can think of at any point here, in this element, I could think of the value of the head right here as the sum of coming from uh, some value from this node, right? This would be node, let's say call one and node two, and this is element one. It would be the sum of some contribution from this node plus the sum of some contribution from this node. I would add those two together and I'd get the value of H at this point. I'll call this one green. All right, so I'm adding this, this green bit plus this blue bit and I get the head here, all right? And I can write that um, that the head, the trial solution from at some point is the sum of the, of the nodal value uh, from each node that creates the element. So here there's the two nodes in an element. We just sum over those two nodes. Um, the, uh, this D is the distance between the nodes, all right? And we come up here and we get the value of our trial solution. All you really need to know is that this is another way, it's just a way of interpolating between the two nodes. And here we just assume that they're straight lines, all right? And I can do the same thing for the weighting functions, all right? I can, I can say the weighting functions are a series of straight lines, all right? Um, and I sum over all the different nodes. Uh, it's, I'm going to have a different, I'm going to label my distance differently because I don't want to do the same. It can be summed over different distances. Let's see. Okay. Yeah. All right. So the bottom line is I can define WH and Q sub H as this. If I go into my, if I go into my weak form, I can plug in these linear interpolations and I can put them in here. And I can put this guy in here for my weighting functions, all right? Okay, and this gets really messy and we are not gonna get into it, but bottom line is you can do a bunch of um, transforms. Well, it's mostly just bookkeeping, all right? And then you make a matrix and some vectors. So a bunch of bookkeeping later. you get to 
a system of equations, K, all right, times D is equal to F, all right? And this K traditionally gets called the stiffness matrix. This traditionally gets called displacement. It's because the finite element method was derived for elasticity and this gets called the forcing matrix uh, or forcing vector, sorry, the vector. The most important thing here is that the stiffness forcing vector, all right. All, I don't want you guys to know how to do the finite element method, but I do want you to know that this stiffness matrix contains the hydraulic conductivity. It contains the element lengths. Element lengths. All right. Um, this, is, this is essentially our heads at nodes, all right? And this would be our forcing function. It includes boundary conditions and uh, sources or sinks. All right, and just like in our, um, just like in our finite difference method, we're going to solve for heads. By doing D is equal to K inverse of F. All right. All right, so it's exactly the same. Uh, it ends up being very similar in the solution methods to finite differences, but this stiffness matrix is the values within it. It's still, so this is still um, a diagonal sparse matrix, just like it was in the finite difference. It has different values that account for these um, complicated geometries, all right? And the uh, F values are a little different because they account for the complicated geometries and the boundary conditions in the weak form, but it's essentially the exact same thing. And you're just gonna do a numerical solution of these two, all right? Okay. So um, that's drinking out of the fire hose a bit. And the bottom line is you can get away with not understanding much about finite elements, except that two main things I want you to take away. The main reason we do it is because it's really good for complex geometry, all right? The second thing is that when we do this, when we do this Galerkin approximation, we have guaranteed that we are not going to have an exactly right solution, all right? We've said that our solution space resides within the space of, of the exact solution, but it's not, we're pretty much, we haven't guaranteed. So there's two things I'll say about the take homes about the finite. really good for complex geometry. 
and meshing becomes very important. You can spend a lot of time getting your mesh to properly align on your irregular geometry. And in fact, you know, there are people who get their PhD just in how you come up with the best meshes for finite elements, all right? But um, it's really good for complex geometry. I would say the equation that you're, you're approximating an equation that approximates your PDE. All right, so the chances are higher for more error. And that means that um, you're not guaranteed that things like, like conservation of mass is not guaranteed. So you really, whenever you're running FEs, you gotta like one of the big things is figuring out how bad is your conservation of mass. You're not gonna conserve mass, like your groundwater budget in an FE code will not be, it will not be, um, you will not have conservation of mass. And so it becomes more, you're really making sure that you're at least close to conservation of mass. So you need to check error in, in particular conservation of mass. Um, all right, and then finally some codes that you'll hear about in groundwater at least. Uh, B flow. Fem water. Comsol. These are all, Comsol is really a generic finite element uh, simulator. But these are all finite element codes that get used a lot in groundwater simulation. Um, and com for example, COMSOL is used in, in many other kinds of, of um, simulation of other partial differential equations. Um, okay, finite elements. The next one we're gonna talk about the final one that we'll talk about, I think we can do it in the next 10 minutes. Um, the next very common method is called finite volume. And sometimes I just call it finite volumes. Some people call it finite volume difference. Um, all right, and in, in the finite volume difference, we're just gonna consider like a, I'm gonna try and draw some kind of random volume here. And the point here is that this volume is arbitrarily shaped. So this is a one, this, this face has area A1, this face has area A2, All right, this space has area A3, and this is A4. All right, so I, I have this, I have this just whatever, it's a random element. We'll call this, uh, we'll call this cell. These are called cells. So this is a cell of arbitrary 
geometry. And we'll, we're just gonna call this cell N, all right? Okay, so here's the fundamental thing with finite volume. Uh, it approximates the um, the conservation equation that we used to derive, say, our PDE. All right, so what do I mean by that? Well, when we derived the groundwater flow equation, we, we used conservation of mass. So an example here, conservation of mass. Right, and we use that to derive our groundwater flow equation. All right, well, what the conservation of mass statement says is the, the change in volume in my cell, all right, is equal to the mass in minus the mass out. So really simply mass in minus mass out. is equal to my volume change in my cell, right? So if I write that in, in math, I might say this. The integral over my whole surface of my cube, all right, that means for every little surface element here, of K times delta H uh, N dot N D S. This is the integral over the full surface of the hydraulic conductivity times the change in head. All right. This is my flux, my Darcy flux. Forget about this uh, delta N. All it means is that the only thing that or the dot n, the only thing that counts is flux that's coming across the face, all right? That's what this dot product of the n, uh, or dot n means. So this is the flux across all my faces, flux across the surface. All right? is equal to the change in volume, SS V D H D D. This is volume change in my cell. All right, so this guy, we'll call him five since that's where we're at right now. This is what we discretize for the finite volume. It's the conservation of mass statement. It's the statement that says, if I want to figure out how much volume has changed in my cell, I just calculate how much came in minus how much came out. So conceptually really easy to think about. Um, so for a finite, so we, so finite volume, we discretize five. All right, and we say for a finite number of cells, um, 
and each cell N has M neighbors, all right? So if we were to look at this cell up here, you know, it would have to have some neighboring cell on this side, on this face, some neighboring cell on this face, you know, so there's M of these neighboring cells adjoining this one cell, all right? Has M neighbors. Then uh, we can approximate our mass statement by saying the sum over all faces all right for for all of my faces it's the conductivity we'll talk about what that is the conductance c n m times the change in head between the two elements All right, I use these H cough and RH, right hand side, RHS. This is, these are the same notation. In fact, the same variables that we talked about for finite differences. This one is essentially storage in the cell at uh, the updated time. This is storage and cell at, at the current time. All right, all this says is that the change, the difference between the change in storage at the, at my last time step and my new time step is the sum of the fluxes in and out of my cell. And I calculate these fluxes using this conductance. So I calculate the head in one element, one of the M neighbors, minus the head in my given cell. All right, and my conductance, C and M, it's the same thing that's in finite differences. It's the area, all right? For example, here, it might be the area A1, all right? times the hydraulic conductivity in that direction. So K and M over the lengths between the two cells. So L and M plus L M N. These are just the two half lengths. You've got one, we're solving for the head in the center of the element. So we use one length from the center of the element to the face in one element and then plus another. So this is just Ka over dl, and this one is dh, all right? Okay, so that's finite volume in a nutshell. It's really pretty straightforward. You're just summing all the fluxes in and out. The trick is that because you've got this arbitrary geometry, you gotta, there's a lot of bookkeeping and figuring out which cells are connected to which. In finite difference, it was very simple. We had just diagonals of this matrix. And for the 1D, it was really easy. It was just a tri-diagonal matrix. And we were able to assemble that really easily. The whole trick in finite volumes is assembling that matrix. But um, we can assemble our matrix A, all right, and we multiply that by H, which is the head at our future time step, and that is equal to our head at our current time step. 
right? And it's the same as the finite difference. We want to, we solve for H n plus one as A inverse times H n. All right. So all of these, I want you guys to realize that every single one of these methods, finite difference, finite element, and now finite volume all come down to solving this system of equations. And it's always ends up with some matrix inverse. All right. And um, we'll get into really, really brief discussions of, of how we solve that. But those solvers, how you go about getting this A inverse uh, is really important in, in how we, how the code ends up executing and how well it ends up solving. All right. Um, some final takeaways for finite volume. Um, some take homes. For the finite volume. Um, so we solve the mass balance equation. So mass balance is usually really good. So unlike finite element where we don't know whether conservation, conservation of mass is not guaranteed in finite element, conservation of mass is pretty much guaranteed in finite volume. We're solving the mass balance equation, so we better freaking conserve mass pretty well. Um, the grids can be really complicated. Um, but meshing is, is hard. So I work a lot with finite volume codes. Our principal problem usually is coming up with good meshes. Um, and because we can only calculate flux across a face, we can get errors if, if none of our faces align very well with our principal fluxes. So that's why meshing can get hard. Um, some codes that use this. Uh, so modflow six, the newest version of modflow. All right. This is a significant change in modflow. So we're going to use modflow 2005 a lot in this class. That was the last supported version of Modflow. The newest version, Modflow 6, uses this finite volume. This is a complete change in the fundamental theory behind the code. And that's a really big game changer. And so any anytime you're, once you go out in the world and you start, if you start uh, modeling with, with Modflow, the difference between Modflow 2005 and Modflow 2006 is really big. Completely different code. Um, the code that I use a lot in my group, pflowtran, all right? That's a finite volume. Another big uh, multi-physics re reactive transport, thermal transport code. Talk to, all right, these are all finite volume codes. Okay, so <clears throat> the, main, the main take homes out of all this talk of solvers or of, of different numerical approximations is we are not, I'm, get, I'm, I'm not gonna ask you to derive a finite element solution on your own. And I'm not gonna ask you to derive a finite volume. But conceptually, it's important to understand um, why we might use the different methods, why we might pick a finite element code, say femwater, and what are the um, advantages and disadvantages of it. So we might, if we have a really complicated geometry, you know, we might want to pick a finite element code. Um, but you know, we better be sure that we're conserving mass. Um, if we're finite differences are very conceptually easy to think about, they're easy to mesh, uh, 
but they're not, those meshes are not gonna be very realistic um, in terms of complicated geometries. All right, so each one of these has an advantage. Um, each one has a disadvantage and you just gotta kind of pick. But most importantly is when you're using a code um, to understand the methodology and what the, what the implications are for that given numerical solution technique. And then finally, we'll get into this later, but all of these codes, all of these codes require us to do this inversion, this A inverse thing. And this is, um, they all require this, these solution methods. And um, as you go on in your modeling career, it's figuring out how to turn, tune that solver to make sure it converges and make sure that your code is running good becomes an important thing. We won't get into that today, but we'll get into it later. Okay, uh, with that, I'm gonna stop my lecture on other methods of numerical solution and figure out how to stop recording.